Well, today is the beginning of talking about artificial intelligence. It's a very difficult topic. I spent much of the last night and today thinking about it and talking to friends about what we really believe. After all, there is no point in giving lectures if it doesn't make the professor think. And so I've done a lot of thinking. Now I'll present material somewhat different than it is in the book, but not too different. The underlying problem, can machines think, is your personal ego. You know the machines can calculate faster, more reliably, cheaper, their freedom from boredom, all kinds of assets the machine has. But you don't like to feel that you are inferior to machines which you have built. So one of the major problems is your ego. You just don't like the idea that machines could really think and outthink you. Now you know it's true in some respects. You know that gun directors have proved superior to any trained people. That many things we are now using machines where humans could not. It is generally stated that we could not have gotten to the moon and back without computers. A second major difficulty is your religion. Now you have different religions. In the Christian religion, you have man created God, sorry, God created man in his image. All the other may well be true also. <laughs> However, how much is the image we mean or not is difficult. People who think the world is going to end in the year 2000 or 2001 are clearly thinking God has five fingers, so he counts the base ten. If they thought God had counted base two, which is a natural one, they would have picked the year 1024 or 2048. They wouldn't pick the round numbers and decimal. There have been repeated pointing out that you cannot portray God, although you will find pictures in the Renaissance showing God as an old man with a beard and looking very, very human. The Mohammedan religion forbids the attempt of images like that because Muhammad realized the futility of trying to think of God as a big souped up version of human beings. That simply you are not to do that kind of thing. Not that they haven't done it occasionally, but it's officially taboo. It's a very, very difficult question because if God made man and man can make machines equal to himself, this puts you in some kind of competition with God and it's a little bit uncomfortable. So there is a very deep, difficult religious question on your part. Can machines think? You don't really like the idea too much if you're deeply religious. There are other problems. Another one is, let me jump forward a little bit and talk about chess playing programs which you know about. If a machine can beat the chess match of the world, it's going to look like machines can think until you look closer. Now when we began, we could not imagine the machines with the capacity now have for rapid and extensive computation. And so we more or less all agreed that by golly, chess requires human thinking. And therefore, if machines can play chess, they can think. Well, once there is a program in existence that does the job, you are inclined to think it's merely a formula and that isn't thinking. The very success of me producing a program which exhibits thinking causes you to deny that that can be thinking. After all, it's only following out a formula. On the other hand, I can raise the question if you're going to do that. Can you think? Is there intelligent life on Earth? Is not the remark which I've used before, you being what you are, the situation being what it is at this moment, can you do other than what you do next? Scratch your ear, rustle in the seat, smile or grin or something else? Can you really do other than what you do? Are you indeed different than a machine? It's a very awkward question. Now back in Greek times, Democritus said all is atoms and void. That's all there is. And this is the classical picture you got from physics. The world consists of molecules banging against each other, radiant energy fields, and so on. That is what the universe is. 
If you think there's a soul, then the question arises, how does a soul interrupt the sequence of molecule banging against molecule to change what is going to happen? There's a very awkward question. If you want to pick a psychophysical parallelism, the idea that there is a psychic world and there is a physical world, then you must answer the question, which is very vexing, how do they interact? Where? How are the motion molecules interfered with if ideas are not material things? On the other hand, if an idea is a material thing, you have great difficulty thinking of just how ideas are stored in your brain. Are they simply particularly compli complicated com uh, compounds or what? All the way around, there is a great deal of difficulty thinking about the whole matter. And so I'm going to review a number of things that happened along the way to give you some background. We are headed for the following situation. This lecture and the next one, I'll talk about what machines have done to a great extent. And the following one, two lectures from now, you come down and sit in the front row so the camera can see you. And you people will discuss between yourselves can machines think? And if nobody wants to talk, I'll stick my finger to somebody and say, you talk. But remember, talk to the camera. So you're going to have to come down to some reason. I do not care what you think. I do care that you do think. And since we have an admiral who's going to be a woman, I will have to change the usual story and say, if the admiral's husband hears you majored in computer science or engineering and at some meeting says, can machines think? I expect you to give a coherent answer. Not that I care which answer you give, but I care that you be able to express your opinions clearly. That is my task, to make you come to terms to some extent. Now, why should I want to do this? Very, very simply. If you believe there's a fundamental between humans and machines, you will not be aggressive about using machines to further your organization and your organization is going to become highly computerized before you leave. On the other hand, if you think machines can think, it's almost certain you're going to try to do things fall flat on your face. And that may be the end of your career. I am suggesting that you will have to come down to something you don't like to do. Both believe and disbelieve at the same time. There really isn't much else you're going to be able to do, so I'm giving you a survey of where we are headed talking to high level. Now, this business of computer thinking started in the, say, early 50s at RAND, when they first got some musical machines, by a couple of guys who tried to play games. Now, why do we play games? Because the object is clear what we're trying to do. The rules are clear. So whether I succeed or not is beyond argument. Either I succeeded or I didn't. Other problems in life are not well defined. What we mean by a solution is not well defined, but games have this very, very nice property. And games like chess were thought to require thinking. Well, they started out trying to do problems like uh, the three cannibals and the missionaries in a boat which would carry two people trying to cross the river. With a side rule that if for a long time the cannibals outnumber the missionaries, they'll eat them. So how do you get them across with, on either shore for any length of time, the cannibals never outnumber the missionaries? Well, there are a number of different solutions, and they were interested in how do people do it. They wanted to produce a program which produced the same kind of general thinking humans did. There are lots of different solutions, and some of them are better than others, but they were interested in that thing. Could they reproduce that kind of thinking? They were not trying to get a result, they were trying to get a pattern of thinking, which shows a great deal of shrewdness on their part. Well, they had several things, by the way, I should say, although they failed, they produced a great many valuable things. They produced uh, list programming. The general problem solver was what they were going to do. They had the idea that if they picked up something like five rules, Look at where you are, look where you want to be, and decrease the distance, either pulling this one down or this one up. You would all let me solve the problem. All you had to do then is give them the general problem solver, give the details of a particular field, like geometry or algebra or something, or calculus, and let the machine systematically, with some side rules about the field, 
reduce the distance between where you are and where you want to be. Well, it didn't work. But a lot of valuable things came out of list processing, came out of a great many other things. So uh, don't minimize the research. It was a failure, but it was a good job nevertheless. Well, that idea died for about 10 years. Then it revived with 50 rules instead of five. Then that failed. Another decade or so went by, and then they had 500 rules of general operation. And I have heard ones with 5,000 rules. In general, this is called expert systems. Or rule-based logic, either one you want. The idea is that I will assemble a bunch of doctors or other experts. I will interview them. I will ask them many questions about how they make decisions. I will code these things. Then I will give them problems to the machine. The machine will consult the rules and come up with the answer. It's very popular. Sometimes it has worked. Many times it has not. Meaning, we don't really understand the business. If you have a method which works sometimes not others, you really don't understand what you're doing. But it has been successful frequently. It's been a big help, sometimes. We, as I say, cannot state exactly what it is, but you will see a great many rule-based logic, and I'll repeat the basic idea. I will get the experts. I will consult them what rules they use, I'll put those rules in the machine, and the machine can now consult. For example, one might say, uh, what does the doctor do when he examines you? He looks for this, this, and this, if that's a symptom. And long, long ago, when I was a child, the doctors had little books which told them, if this, then look for that, this, so and so. And periodically, uh, the buzzer would ring on their desk while they were interviewing you. Uh, and they would excuse them for a moment, and they'd go out and consult this little book, and they'd go back and say, well, now, have you ever had any such and such, such, such? They were using a decision tree system of getting down to a decision. So it's a very old process. There's no doubt about it. It was effective to some extent. My candid opinion is that we could do it now better than the average doctor, if we really wanted to. Because the average doctor, for example, has not seen a case in diphtheria, but if you have it, the machine would recognize it. But the average doctor, never having seen it, wouldn't necessarily recognize it. Furthermore, if an epidemic comes up, I can change the probabilities of various things, and the machines promptly can react to the new situation, whereas the doctors can't do that as easily. The reason you can't do it is psychological and legal. A doctor is allowed to be human. If he shows in court that he showed due prudence, which is a technical word they have, then he's innocent, even if he didn't call your death. He used due prudence. If a program has an error and your relative dies, you're likely to go to court and sue, and the question is, who pays the bill? Who do you sue? The programmer? You can't sue the machine. The owner who sold you the service? It becomes very, very awkward because if there is a program, then it can be gone through very carefully and find a bad decision. Where if it's a human doctor or errors, we are sympathetic and recognize to err as human. Therefore, for legal reasons, we will be very hard put to do this. Now we, furthermore, there's a next question which is difficult. If the machine did diagnose you, and you got a program at home to diagnose yourself, and we've had kits which measured whether you had this, that, or symptoms for years and years. Who would have the right to assign the drugs to be used to cure you? Answer, you may very well have programs at home will diagnose you accurately. You go to the doctor, and the doctor will repeat the things and go through the same track, more or less, and then he will prescribe the drugs that you want. But you won't be able to get them over the counter. That's probably what's going to happen. Not that the expert system wouldn't work. It wouldn't work for human reasons and legal reasons. That's one of the many things that stop you. Now, I'm going to use the expression, can machines think, as a glib thing for a field called artificial intelligence, which is how much what man normally thinks he's doing as a human being can be done by machines. What parts of the burden of living can we shove off on that damn machine? 
Now we've done a pretty good job at bustle power. In caveman days, essentially, man had to do everything. He had to lift his own, and he had very few animals to supplement his muscle power. Now, if you look out what they're doing there, there's all kinds of power machines to make it so that the workers do not live solely by their muscle power. They do some, do some hard work, but a great deal is supplemented by machines. So we have done a passable job of supplementing man by machines for power. We are now entering the age of supplementing man with machines at the brain level. It's that simple. But we won't get perfect one in either case. Still it's useful to say, can machines think? Now I want to first say that that is stated wrong. It's conventionally stated that way, but it's all wrong. You know the problem is, can you write a program so the machine can think? It's not a question of can machines think? is can you write the program? Right? That's the real problem. Can you write the program? Do you know how to do a program? There's what a bottleneck. I will go on and say machines think constantly, but I'm really meaning, can you write a program which will cause a machine to think? Because if you can't write the program, the machine isn't going to do it. And if you can write a program, then the machine can. It's that simple and that awful. Now, the competition between man and machine is what is usually taken up, and I had trouble with Bell Labs all the years with my boss, and I always said, I am not truly interested in the competition. I'm interested in the cooperation. What can man and machine do together that they cannot do separately? I prefer to look at the problem that way. It's not terribly different, but it puts a different emphasis and a different flavor. I don't care for the competition so much as I care for how much can they change your organization to do a better overall job? And I gave you at the end of one chapter all the reasons why machines are favored, speed, accuracy, reliability, all those things. So that is where I'm going to approach the thing slowly. Now, what is a machine? Back in the late 40s when I was at Bell Labs and using a machine, they were just coming in, still relay machines, and we asked, uh, before I asked, what can machines think? What is a machine? And somebody said, well, it couldn't be organic. And I said, oh, I can't build a wooden machine. They took that back. And to be ornery, I observed, well, if I were to keep a nervous system of frog alive and use that for a memory device, would you call that a machine? What is a machine? There isn't an acceptable definition. You have an intuitive idea, but I think you'd be hard put to say exactly what you mean by a machine and not a living thing. Second place, what is thinking? There was a Jesuit engineer, Jesuit trained engineer. He had become an engineer, shall we say, failed to be religious, maybe what he want. And what he said, very simply, thinking is what humans can do and machines cannot do. That solves the problem, doesn't it? We protested on several grounds. But the more I've thought about it, the more that is what science does do. In mathematics, we regularly make the defin definitions so we can prove the theorems. He made the definition to settle the question. Thinking is what humans can do and machines cannot. We tried to argue with him that with better machines, which we could see over the horizon, the gap between what machines and humans could do would be slowly shrunk inch by inch by inch until maybe there would be nothing left. In which case, the definition wasn't really red hot. The real objection to definition is one that is a very simple to state. Definitions are arbitrary. Those definitions which are fruitful for further action are preferred to those which do not. Now his definition, thinking of something machines can do and humans can't, does not suggest what you can do tomorrow. It leaves you there. If you take the other definition, some other one, which allows the possibility machines can think, then you have a positive program to do something to see that they can do it. So the assumption that machines can think is more fruitful than the assumption that machines cannot think. 
it's up to your definition. There isn't any God-given definition. And if you look in a dictionary, yeah, you can believe dictionary if you want, but after all, we use the words and the dictionaries only copy the way we use them. So dictionaries are not a source of definition, they're only a convenient summary of how we use things. Now, as I said, one of the problems is your ego. You want to be able to think. And you don't want trees or rocks. Well, certainly rocks, you don't want them to be able to think. You're doubtful you want a tree to be able to think. You may be a little ambitious, ambiguous about whether your cat can think. But you're pretty sure rocks cannot think. Well, some people will say, well, what I mean by thinking is what Einstein Newton did. If you take that for definition, nobody in this room can think. That's unsatisfactory, right? It can't be that high flown. It's got to be something lower than the very best high class thinking. Because, as I say, it's got to emerge more or less that you can think. Otherwise, you're not going to be happy with the definition. Furthermore, I say, if you can't think, it's going to be embarrassing and not be very fruitful. Still, I will raise the question, are you sure you can think? Is there such a thing? Am I talking about something that's not there? Now, if we are different from the living world, the rest of it, then although you may or may not believe in religion, it doesn't matter. If you, if you believe, in evolu uh, you believe in evolution, there could be a point in time when God shoved the soul in you. That that's how you differ. But when I look at my cat, I am a pretty confident that the cat is self-aware and self-conscious. When the cat pulls a boo-boo and falls off of something, it shows an enormous amount of self-awareness whether it's stop and carefully lick his paw and stroll off as if nothing had happened. He's clearly recognized that he goofed and we knew it. He shows all kinds of self-awareness. So I hesitate to draw a line say only humans can think. And furthermore, experiments with other animals do indicate that they can do surprising things. In fact, I suggest you, if you believe in evolution, at the very beginning of life, the amoebas, or whatever they were, must have had some ability to abstract in order to survive. They had to get some idea what was food and what was not food, how to avoid dangers and not. They must have had some power of abstraction at the very bottom. And if, as we have demonstrated in the laboratory, one-cell animals can be trained to turn this way or that way, then thinking cannot necessarily be a function of the nervous system because one cell animal doesn't have a nervous system. It's a little awkward question. Now physics traditionally believes you are a collection of molecules in a radiant energy field. And this was the belief that I got and had for many years when I was young before machines came in and made me start thinking about what I believe. As you get older and older, you apparently get softer in the head or something, I don't know, but there came a time after being here, means last, within the last 20 years, when thinking about self-awareness, self-consciousness, and other things, I said they were too real to make me believe that they were artifacts of what's happening. Now let me point out to you what you can do in physics. We believe the molecules have no friction. Reason why? Air sealed in a chamber in ancient times, opened up, the molecules are still banging forth. There is no friction between molecules. On the other hand, all large assemblies do have friction. So clearly an assembly of molecules may have properties that the individual ones do not have. An assembly of a large amount of parts of you may have properties that no piece has. It's a difficult point. It's a very difficult one. Now, the failure in the past of artificial intelligent people to produce machines that thought do tend to suggest that maybe machines can't. There's a difference. And in reading Edward Teller the other day, in a book he wrote 15 years ago, so he can't be held to it now, he said, if you'll go back to quantum mechanics, which, by the way, I will discuss in one of the later chapters, there is the wave-particle duality. 
Light looks like particles and looks like waves. You were probably, if you took optics, given the wave theory, Young and Fresnel theory of light being waves. But Newton had sort of backed, or he did not completely back, the particle theory, that it lands with a plunk. Quantum mechanics came up with the duality. Light is both wave and particle, and neither. And the same with electrons. The Davison-Germer experiment showed that electrons had wave-like properties. What happens when you take a course in quantum mechanics is the following. The professor shows you the two-slit experiment, where two slits are like. Now the pattern on the received photograph shows wave pattern depending upon the spacing of those two slits. But if, part, if light is a particle, it goes through one hole or the other. It doesn't know where the other one is. So they have to claim, well, it was a wave. It went through both of the sense of distance. But when it hit the photographic plate, all the energy hit at that one uh, molecule because it developed one molecule of photographic plate. So although the wave was spread out, when it hit the photographic plate, it was a particle. So the professor says, if he's honest, I cannot explain the wave-particle duality. You'll get used to it. This is now 50, 60, approaching 70 years since quantum mechanics, the new quantum mechanics began. And for 70 years, professors of physics who taught quantum mechanics have had effectively to say exactly that. Now, you may be offended at the idea you can't think of. So let me give you some reasons why. There are smells that dogs can smell that you cannot. There are sounds that various animals can hear that you cannot. There are sights you cannot see. You've only got one octave of visual light. You can't do those things because you are built the way you are. Why should you be offended if I say there are thoughts you cannot think, given the brain wired the way it is? Why should you think you can think every thought? Maybe that's one of the ones that cannot be thought. Maybe humans really cannot think the way you have to in quantum mechanics if you want to get by. That it is both one and the other. Well, it's the same thing I'm trying to say here now. The same ambiguity about whether machines can think or not. Yes, they can. No, they can't. Wave is a light is a particle, it's a wave. You get used to it. One of the things I'm going to talk about about great scientists later on is a thing I discovered late in my study of great scientists, and that is the tolerance of ambiguity. So I'm deliberately introducing you now to the problem of ambiguity. You both believe and disbelieve. Neither is right nor wrong. It's very hard for people to do it because you are trained yes or no, and your whole language is yes or no. But if you really examine life, you will decide that life is not yes or no. Everything is shades of gray. It's not something is true or false. It's a little bit more true or a little bit more false. So I'm deliberately introducing this thing and deliberately producing on you, in you, I hope, a tolerance ultimately for ambiguity. Now the only way to get it in is make you start talking. And when you talk, you tend to believe what you say. It's like the psychologist used to claim, you don't grin because you're happy. You're happy because you grin. And in some case made, the same way. If I can get you to talk about things, then I can get you to believe. As long as you don't talk about it, I really can't get you to believe. And I'm now trying to get you to believe in one side or the other. Let's see what you can do about it. Now, I told you about self-awareness and self-consciousness. I'm inclined to believe it there. About a soul, I'm a little bit more ambiguous. In the Middle Ages, some people wanting to know how much the soul weighed, took a guy who was dying and put him on a scale balance. And when he died, they didn't see any change in the weight. So they concluded the soul didn't have any weight. I'm a little ambiguous about a soul because I'm not sure what a soul is. But I'm more confident, having thought for a long while, about self-awareness and self-consciousness, and I find it very difficult to believe that it's only molecules banging against molecules. But I may be wrong. So I'm beginning to move toward the position that uh, Edward Teller said in the book, 
that man should be viewed both as a set of molecules and as spirit or whatever you want, something else, non-material. That you are both of those. I have no proof. No one has any proof. But let me tell you a couple of stories about how science has progressed and what we do. Aristotle and through the Middle Ages, the belief was that earth was material and corruptible, but the heavens were perfect and eternal. There were different rules. The heavens were different than the earth. Well, this guy Newton caused trouble. He said, you know, that apple falling is the same as that moon falling. The same physics applies. He proceeded to write a book which accounted for a great many things that happened in the solar system. And also, using his reasoning, we found many things we had not known, like we found planets we'd never known existed, where the form is predicted. Furthermore, if you look at double stars, and you carefully calibrate what you see, you decide that they are operating on an inverse square law of gravity. And if you look at the spectral lines, they have the same elements out there, apparently, that we have. So we have passed from a belief that the heavens were different than the Earth fundamentally to exactly the opposite view. There is no difference in the physics in outer space and on Earth. A similar thing happened in chemistry. In chemistry, it was believed that organic compounds could not be made by people. It had to be done by living things. There was some vitalistic property that people had which communicated to what they did, but it controlled the chemistry. Unfortunately, in about 1823, uh, German chemist synthesized urea, or he synthesized ureic acid. It took quite a while, 20, 30, 40 years, before it was widely accepted. But from the theory that organic chemistry was something that could only be done by living creatures, we have passed to the opposite extreme. The chemists now believe anything you could do in the human body, you could do in a test tube. Now, they cannot prove that either, and no more can we prove that all the universe has the same rules as we have here on Earth. After enough successes, we jump to the other side. You have, and I'm expressing to some extent, a vitalistic theory of human beings. There's something about you beyond the molecules which enables you to think and to do other things. But so long as I don't know what I'm talking about, I can't do much about writing a program. Thus, take the word meaning. Just as St. Augustine, when asked, what is time? He said, I know what time is and do you ask me, but when I think about it, I don't know. The same way, when I ask myself, what do I mean by meaning, I find I don't know. And therefore, I cannot write a program. Therefore, I cannot expect machines to deal with meaning. They can deal with symbols. But if I can't write a program for dealing with meaning, then how do I expect the machine to deal with meaning? I'm up the proverbial creek with a paddle. Now, where are the stalemate to a great extent? And these assertions which I have said so far, I can assert all I want, I can make no demonstration. You can assert all you want, and you can make no demonstration. But I need to take up one or more thing which I realized I forgot a little earlier. And that is that a great many of you will say, I don't want my life to depend upon a machine. Well. When you get old and your heart fails a little bit and has some trouble, they may very well connect up a pacemaker to you, right up to your nervous system, and your life will depend upon that machine. Furthermore, if you go to a hospital and get an emergency ward after you come out of an operation, most modern hospitals will put you in and connect you up to a computer, which will monitor various vital signs. When the signs go out of control, a nurse will come dashing down the hall and do something. A nurse in the room would get bored and she could not watch as well as a bunch of machines. So they'll connect to a machine and your life will depend upon that damn machine. Furthermore, to get closer to your home to you, in order to build better airplanes with superior behavior, we have built unstable airplanes. They're very, very unstable. So we put in the computer that about every millisecond 
stabilizes the plane. About every millisecond, bing, 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 is constantly doing it. The pilot is left with a large plan, but the computer is keeping the thing going. And if the computer ever stopped, that pilot could by no means control the plane, and he would go crash. The flag of that plane depends upon the computer. So his life depends upon the computer. The idea you don't want your life to depend upon your computer is really quite superficial. You haven't thought to the extent to which you want your life controlled by computers. For example, stop and go sign. You may be driving a road and you come to this red light. You will generally wait until the light changes before you cross. Even if it's late at night and you don't see any other traffic. Now some of you will go through it, but most of you will wait. In short, even when you know a machine gave a bad decision, you will go along with the decision. Furthermore, if you think of traffic, and you've ever had traffic being directed by a policeman, as I did in my youth lots of times, you will find in traffic jams a machine can do a better job than a tra policeman because the machine will operate regularly and I can anticipate when it's going to go green and get ready to move. I can't anticipate when a policeman is going to finally stop this way, do this way. You can't cooperate with a human being the way you can cooperate with a machine. So there are a lot of reasons why you prefer working with machines, although psychologically you don't want to be the inferior pair, member of a pair, but you in fact have accepted the position. You've already accepted it, you just want to quibble about it because you don't like your ego being put that way. So what am I going to do now is start showing you some of the things machines have done. And I told you how or why we picked up games. And so I'm going to take up a game which you may know of. Three-dimensional tic-tac-toe, a four by four by four by four array. I've drawn them side by side. And the object is to get four items in a row. There are 64 squares, there are 76 straight lines. And your problem is, how do you play to win? Well, the first thing you have to generate is a legal move. All games have to generate a legal move. It means in this case, no other pieces on that square, right? That's easy. Now, if, there are the enemy, if you have three men in a row, Obviously, you should play the fourth one, and you win, and that's the end of the matter. So the first rule is clear. If you have three in a row, play the fourth. If you don't have three in a row, and he's got three in a row, you'd better block him. Because you can't win, and he'll move, win the next move, right? You've got to block him. Then the next move one is what we call a fork. For example, here I have two men on a line, and two men on a line with a common point. If I play there, Nothing you can do. You cannot block both three in a row at one time, right? So if I've got a fork, I grab it. If I haven't got a fork, I've got to block yours, right? So those first four rules are perfectly clear what you must do. They're perfectly definite statements. But now, if none of those apply, what do you do? Where do you place a man? Well, in the beginning, when you examine those 76 lines, you'll find the corner squares and the four in the bottom, and the have more lines than the other squares. So if you play where your men have more possibilities of winning and force the opponent to play where there's less combinations, you seem to be gaining some advantage. Furthermore, if you have two in a line, you can play one more, he's forced to block. Then you can find another two in a line, he's forced to block, and you hope sooner or later you can generate something like this in some of the planes running through this thing somehow, in which case you'll win. But if you start a sequence of forcing moves and are forced to give it up, he will immediately move or she on the opposite and start forcing you move and probably win. The first person goes on the offense either wins or loses. It's seldom shifting back and forth several times because you're dead. So the game is easy in the beginning and then there has to be these heuristic rules, no fixed rules to play. Now, Shannon wrote a program early, Claude Shannon, of uh, how to play chess. How do you evaluate the position of a board? How important is the control of the center of the board? How much is a pass pawn? How much is a piece? What is the value of these various parts? And every book which you read about how to play chess inferentially gives you how to compare this with that. How much is a bishop worth the knight, and so on. How much is a pass pawn worth? How much is a double pawn not worth it? 
all these kind of things are more or less in French. You, all they did was take those things out and put them in a more or less explicit formula, turn around and have a girl, not in our department, but another department, secretary, well, computer girl, to simulate chess and played several games and found out how good the formula is. He published the thing and it was the beginning of playing chess. Los Alamos tried playing chess on a six by six board because they had a slower machine. They simply took the bishops off and you played with a six by six board. Otherwise, the game was pretty much the same and they played some passable games. They found they could do passably well. Well, machines have gotten better and you know you can buy chess playing, handheld chess playing machines that can beat you generally speaking. It's not too hard. We have not beat the chess masters, but we'll come down to that. I think we will pretty soon. So that's what games are about. I've given you an indication of how. Now, what was wrong with that? Pretty much just that told. Well, nobody really cares about it. I don't know anybody who's made a complete try and game it, but probably somebody has. Let me talk about Art Samuel. Samuel said, Check, chess is too hard. Let me play checkers. So Samuels wrote a program for playing checkers, which included block pieces, control the center, and so on. He gave it various constants, evaluation. Now he did the following thing. He took that formula, perturbed a couple of coefficients. He had a second formula. He let the machine play against itself, say 10 games, and if one formula won eight out of the 10, it was clearly superior. So he did it again. And if he found some changes good, he kept on making those changes until he came to a relative peak where no changes that would do any good. They started on some other parameters. And he went around. When he got back again, he perturbed the first ones again and again and again. He went around and around and around. Now, Art Samuels cannot play very good checkers. He's dead now, but he couldn't even that time. The pro got better and better. It got so good that there's a lovely movie out showing the checker champion of, Kentucky, of uh, Connecticut playing the machine. And it shows the guy sitting down, a very nice person, but not really sophisticated. He's embarrassed to be playing a machine. And he doesn't see it too much. He's sort of amused. But as the game goes on, he clearly shifts his attitude until he's got very wary of the opponent. When the opponent finally beats him, he's got a very different attitude toward the program. And when Art Samuel says, of course, you know, the machine learned how to play the game from the simplest rules, he says, you mean the machine learned in a couple weeks? All it took me 40 years of playing to learn? Samuel says, yeah. Now, you're going to say, take an ambiguous view about that thing. Did the machine learn from experience? Some of you are going to promptly hide behind the statement, oh, it was all programmed in. But then I will say, when you took geometry, was not the teacher putting a loading program in on how to do problems? Weren't you guided to how to do geometry problems? Did you learn from experience or did she put it all in? Are you more than a machine? Do you have something better than that kind of learning system that you don't have learning programmed into you? Are you sure? Because one of the things I'm gonna raise again, this idea that machines cannot learn from experience, it's kind of hard to get around Art Samuel's example. I will tell you again, he simply took a reasonable program, had an arbitrary way practically perturbing coefficients, and letting the machine play against itself and from experience of playing many games, since he always has a random element in when two moves are about the same, he has a random element so he can play one or the other. So when the two one point played the other, they played ten different games and you took the better. And the program got enormously better than it was. In the beginning, it was lousy, anybody could have beat it. In the back end, from only from its experience playing against itself, it beat the Kentucky state champion, Checkers. Did it learn from experience? Didn't it? It's a very hard question to answer. You don't like the idea that a machine can learn from experience, because, oh, come on now, that's what intelligence is, learning from experience, isn't it? Isn't that what you meant by being intelligent? You can learn from experience? But didn't that program learn? It's not an easy question to answer. And I'm bringing that up one to make you think hard about the matter. Now I've set the stage to a great extent for artificial intelligence. You will never understand the problem until you yourself start asking yourself the questions. How will I answer various kinds of questions? What will I accept as a test the machines can learn 
or cannot. What will I accept that there is an essential difference between man and machine, beyond my own personal prejudices or my religious convictions? How will we ever decide these things? I say you will not make much progress in artificial intelligence until you become involved with these questions and ask yourself what it is that you feel are reasonable ways to answer this miserable question. Can machines think, or as I prefer, can programs be written so machines can exhibit thinking? They clearly exhibit, I say, learning from experience. If you will not struggle with your own beliefs, you probably will not get very far. And I'll give you again my view. It's ambivalent. And next time I'll give you a bunch more examples of what machines have done and some more examples of why I both believe the machines can think and I don't believe they can. It rests on this duality which I've been slowly forced to accept. There's more to you than a bunch of molecules. There's a dual look of you. You are just a bunch of molecules in radiant energy field and you are not. Every teacher has to believe implicitly. If only I say the right things, you will have to understand. You will have no choice if only I say the right thing. In the same way you treat your children frequently. If only you raise them right, they would behave right. You are acting as if the child had no free will when you do that. On the other hand, you act frequently as if the child did have free will. You are enormously ambivalent about whether your child has free will or not. I will repeat, when you try to teach the child something, you have a feeling if only you do things right. If you only you spank them at the right times and praise them at the right times, the child will grow up to be a very nice person. That's what you more or less believe. And you believe that you've only to behave right and the child will come out all right. That's what you believe, assuming you have children. So you yourself are terribly ambivalent about the whole question of whether children have free will or whether they are just machines which will have to do what they have to do. If you only raise them right, they'll turn out to be good. But if you don't raise them right, it's your fault. It's deep in our society and it's getting deeper now. When children are misraised, there's a great increasing tendency for us to blame the parents because they did not behave right. We don't blame the child. We are adopting a very, very strong, an increasingly strong attitude that free will is a mirage. That there is no such thing. Our society, for example, in trying to cure poverty, there is a whole school who believes all I've got to do is clean up the neighborhood and change the buildings and the people will now have to quit being criminals and behave themselves. I've only changed the environment and they will have to reform. Clearly, a complete statement that these criminals have no free will, they're simply reacting to their environment, and a change in their environment will compel them to change. It's widespread in our society. You'll have to come to terms with what extent you believe this myth that your children have free will and people, and to what extent do you believe that we are machines. I see you next Tuesday. We have more on artificial intelligence.